it's, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, like Pete, I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Mike. I'm the CEO and founder of Q Control. And today it's a real privilege to tell you about work that we've done and an opportunity that all of you have interested in applying quantum computing, interested in consuming quantum computing, interested in pushing this field forward to actually get meaningful results from real quantum computers today via technology in automated error suppression. Now, if you're not familiar with Q-Control, we are a quantum technology company. Uh, we just celebrated our five-year birthday, which is very exciting. And our role in the community is to build infrastructure software. We're a category-defining business. Like VMware in classical computing, our focus is on building infrastructure software that actually delivers useful computational capabilities in our case, focusing on what is the key bottleneck in this field, that being a theme you'll see throughout the talk, error and hardware failure. We provide more or less everything that connects from the lowest levels of hardware, the control electronics and associated uh, uh, low-level firmware, all the way up to applications, algorithms, and of course the cloud services that all of us have come to rely on. We bridge that gap with infrastructure software in the middle. Now, at this point, having come to be around eight years, uh, excuse me, five years old, we have roughly 8,000 uh, users of our software, software that services the needs of a variety of different kinds of users, many of whom are in research. So we have customers and partners in government, national laboratories in the U.S. and around the world. We work with many of the largest commercial providers of quantum computing hardware, doing R&D and, of course, having production systems. And we, uh, of course, continue to work with academic partners around the world, uh, developing next, next generation solutions for uh, this kind of technology. And for what it's worth, we've been uh, very grateful for the accolades that we've received for our work. I think the reason all of us are here is this slide. It's the fact that it's been identified that quantum computing promises really transformational capabilities across an exceptionally wide range of applications. These are applications that start in, for instance, transport and logistics optimization and carry through to pharma, to machine learning, to material science, to things like space logistics, to uh, finance, to next generation machine learning, to industrial chemistry. When you add up all of these opportunities for quantum computing to solve problems of real commercial value, this is what, of course, has led the Boston Consulting Group and others, of course, to project that in the future this has the opportunity to be an $850 billion net market impact. That's why we're all here. But there is this challenge that is, in many cases, unspoken. It's that quantum hardware actually has an Achilles heel, that over time, it tends to degrade, that when we put information into systems that obey the rules of quantum mechanics, over time, the environmental interaction leads to a degradation of that information. That degradation causes error in the execution of algorithms. This is the Achilles heel of hardware. This is what consumes almost every single dollar that has been spent to date in building this kind of technology. And it is what fundamentally stands between us and the realization of that $850 billion opportunity. Hardware error blocks more or less everything we want to do in quantum computing. And we know that as the field has transitioned in the last few years to be primarily academically driven to now very, very heavily industrially driven, as we've seen in just uh, the last talk from Pete, there is a need that is emerging, and I wouldn't say it's urgent, but it is gaining an urgency for end users, for the ultimate consumers of quantum computers to actually start getting useful insights from the algorithms that they are running, to actually start showing that it is advantageous or likely in the near future to be advantageous to choose a quantum solution. And quite importantly, we know something more specific about this, that this is insight that has to be gleaned from hardware. This is uh, the result of some survey work that we had done earlier in this calendar year. It focused on research teams. It focused on asking questions about the needs of researchers, not necessarily industry end users. People who build next generation hardware, hardware experimentalists, but also theoreticians and algorithm developers. In this particular case, we asked, what kind of hardware do you need in two or three years to meet your research obligations and your research objectives. 
research objectives that will help us deliver on those end user applications three, four, five years down the line? And the answer is quite incredible. That about 50% of the respondents from the theory and algorithm development side said in the next two to three years, in order to continue making progress in their research, they must have access to systems with 50 or more qubits. They need to be getting insights from algorithms run on 50 qubit machines. 50 qubits, quite importantly, is effectively beyond the reach of classical simulators. This is an important insight because while simulators are an important tool, an important bridge, this kind of survey response suggests that they have a reasonably short shelf life. Algorithm designers, algorithm developers, and end users need results from hardware. But this, I think, is a familiar user experience. When you run something on real quantum hardware, what you typically get is noise. This is a reasonably simple problem. It's called Grover's search. It is a needle in a haystack uh, type search where you're looking for a particular marked state. If everything works well, that's what you get. The quantum computer outputs the location of that needle in the haystack. But canonically, what you typically get, and this is real data taken on real machines, is the bottom, where you see that the set of outcomes does not correctly identify the marked state, the location of the needle. In fact, it's not even one of the most likely outcomes. The noise, the error in the system, blocks the insight that we're trying to get. It's like we're stumbling around in the dark, looking for the kinds of insight that inform us about the future of quantum computing in our industries. But that really changes today. And it's extremely exciting to get to tell you about a new product that we have just brought to market that just came av became available for free to everyone here yesterday called Fire Opal to help you see a light in that dark. What Fire Opal delivers is the ability to turn commercial, real quantum hardware into useful computational tools. Now, I appreciate that at a glance, the numbers here look almost ridiculous in terms of how good they are. One of our core values at Q-Control is to be real, another is to be trusted. So throughout the rest of this talk, I will show you real data that validate these claims. I'll tell you more about them. And of course, I'll point you to an archive paper that lays all of this out in tremendous technical detail. Fire Opal top line allows you to run greater, more, uh, excuse me, algorithms with greater complexity and greater value to you. 10x deeper circuits can be run on the same hardware using our software. Because the technology that makes this work is very different than some of what you've heard about earlier in this conference, things like error mitigation or probabilistic error cancellation, because the underlying technology is so different, it can give you enormous cost savings in compute, over 100x reduction in your cost. It also is validated to give well over 1,000x improvement in the likelihood that the computer gives you the correct answer. The highest we've seen is 9,000x improvement in a real algorithm run on a real commercial system. And for you, the end users, the important part here is we understand you don't want to be scientists exploring the extraordinarily interesting to me field of error suppression, of quantum control. This is not what you want. You want real inputs turned into real insights. And so for end users of the tool, all they worry about is what's in the purple box. An input algorithm and an output result. Everything else is orchestrated in the back end by our performance and accelerating infrastructure software, Fire Oval, and we connect automatically to supported backends. Right now, on day one, the supported backends are from IBM, and we're very pleased that we've announced that we've integrated with uh, AWS Bracket with future support for new hardware platforms coming via that platform in the next few months. Now, what's under the hood is really quite a remarkable bit of technology. For the experts in the room, I'll briefly talk you through the different parts of this. But I want to start off by saying all of this is completely automated and zero configuration. An end user does one thing. They say fireopal.execute, and you tell us what circuit you want run. That's it. There is no configuration. Everything else is done by us and our AI tools in the background. So what happens under the hood? First, we have a compiler. This is not surprising. Everybody needs a compiler. Ours is pretty good. 
but that's not where I would say our key innovation lies. The real innovation lies in this next step, error-aware hardware mapping. We consume information about the back end that's either provided to us by the hardware platform or that we derive from our own characterization, and we use that to ensure that the way we route a circuit onto a device maximally leverages the best-performing devices, the best-performing qubits. Next, we interleave something called dynamic decoupling. Some of you may have heard of this before in the context of scientific experiments. Here, this is automatically interleaved into the idle periods in an algorithm's execution in a way that not only prevents dephasing on the individual qubits, but also cancels a really significant source of error called crosstalk. It does this in a context-aware manner. It understands not just what is happening to the idle qubit, but also its neighbors. This information together allows for dynamic decoupling to be automatically integrated. It's not just one pulse. It's a sequence that is chosen based on all of this contextual information, and it's all automatic. Next, we have AI agents that completely redefine the machine, learning, uh, the machine language used to implement gates. What is the definition of an X gate or a C naught or a cross resonance? Our AI agents do this autonomously. It takes six minutes. It's done ahead of time during calibration time. Creates a lookup table of new gate definitions that are called when you execute an algorithm through Fireable. Again, completely invisible to you. Hardware execution is managed, and then we have a form of measurement error mitigation that improves readout errors in the device. Again, 100% automated. No configuration, no settings, nothing to change, and all of these individual capabilities engineered to work together. That's one of the hardest things to do in this kind of framework. We're very pleased that it integrates with a really wide variety of programming frameworks at higher levels for algorithm execution. Qiskit, PyQuil, Circ, and Bracket. We're very excited to be an early user of uh, the pulse level control in AWS Bracket. But this is designed to make it easy for anybody to connect their algorithms into this. So what does it do? Remember this problem that I showed you, our, 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 you know, our, our situation where we ended up stumbling around in the dark because the errors were so substantial that you couldn't even get an approximation to the right answer. When you add that one line of code, fireable.execute, you get the bottom right. Qualitatively, this looks much more like the ideal distribution. Importantly, it correctly identifies the answer in the output. It tells you where that needle in the haystack is located. And it does this in a binary way. The machine gave you the wrong answer to start with, and now it gives you the right answer. Quantitatively, how much more right? That's where we get to this more than 1,000x. This is data associated with running a, an algorithm called bernstein vazirani It's run, again, on an IBM backend. And this is, I want to point out, a logarithmic scale. The vertical axis here is logarithmic. What you see is that there is an enormous gap between the hardware limits given to us by T1, the incoherent error limits, that's the red line at the top, and what is typically achieved when you run an algorithm on the machine. That's the white and the gray. Those are the default settings using all the toys in, in Qiskit. When you add one line of code, you push right up to within a factor of two of the absolute best the hardware can do the T1 limit. This is where we get this massive multi-thousand time improvement in the likelihood of getting the correct answer. And you see that that gap grows exponentially with circuit width, with the number of qubits used in the device. The biggest we've used so far was the 16 qubit devices, but we expect this trend to continue to diverge. No configuration, no overhead, single shot deterministic outcome. If you are focused on problems in pharma or finance, you probably encountered an optimization hybrid algorithm called QAOA. It's very popular these days. This involves combining a little bit of quantum compute with a bigger classical loop. In this case, the classical loop wants to navigate an optimization landscape. The ideal optimization landscape is showed on the left. That's simulated, that's noiseless. When you point by point measure what comes out of the quantum computer, this is what you get. It's only about 3% similar to what you should get, according to a, an image processing metric called structural similarity. Now, this is a manifestation of something that many will have 
encountered called the Barron Plateau problem. That noise and error in the hardware has led to the structure that we want to optimize over, moving over these hills and valleys, it gets washed out. When you replace that execution with Fire Opal, this is what you get. Again, by the eye test, it actually looks like what you expect. But more importantly, by, a, by two quantitative metrics, it's transformational. The first, structural similarity, it's almost 30 times closer structurally than what we started with. But importantly, because of that barren plateau problem, when you run the classical loop and you ask it to navigate that landscape to find the best answer, the loop typically just times out because it's not seeing changes as it changes parameters. If you use Fire Opal, in the demonstrations we've done, in about 10 iterations, we find the correct solution. It's a binary transformation. QAOA does not work. QAOA does work with Fire Opal. I told you you can run deeper circuits. Here's a demonstration of that. Again, Bernstein Vassarani for this particular demonstration, looking at how deep a circuit you can execute before you have onset of error. And in this plot, again, a logarithmic plot, you see that without Fire Opal, you have this exponential decay, which is very rapid, and an exponential decay, which is an order of magnitude weaker, that is slower, using Fire Opal. That means that you can run a more complex algorithm, an algorithm with more gates that does more interesting things, 10x more, with no changes to the hardware, and zero effort on your part. Here's one more final demonstration. In this demonstration, we looked at a complex, op opter, excuse me, complex algorithm, quantum Fourier transform with mid-circuit measurements. In this case, we're doing a comparison. And the comparison is between a moderately priced, uh, in this case, IBM machine, and a high value, high quantum volume premium backend. This is a linear scale. And so what I want to point out is that these are now indistinguishable. A reasonably small quantum volume 32 machine performs indistinguishably within a few percent. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's a little bit worse. Indistinguishable from the high value backend. This is critical because many people want to prototype. They want to test their algorithms and they want to do that without going immediately to the premium backends that are extremely important for running the large scale algorithms with many more qubits. To start, this allows you to test on more moderately priced backends. And as an example, the back of the envelope, this is the price differential. To run an algorithm at the extent of tuning parameters where you might, say, assemble a scientific manuscript, it would cost about $100,000 to do this with the alternative backend exclusively, and around 250 bucks if you use Fire Opal on IBM systems. That's transformational in terms of capability for prototyping. And taken together, all of those outcomes that we have tested with end users, in this case, uh, Julian Van Velten from Capgemini, leads our customers to say things like, in the years ahead, as we move closer to quantum advantage, Fire Opal will enable real applications to deliver value sooner. This is the critical thing that we bring to the field to accelerate the path to quantum advantage. So today, you can access this fully automated, completely configuration-free error correction and suppression in medium-sized quantum processors for free. You can do it right after my talk. In the next couple of months, we'll expand to access larger backends and backends from a variety of other providers by AWS Bracket, and we're very pleased that we'll be connecting via a partnership we announced a few weeks ago to the software stack from Classic to allow you to go from high-level problem definition all the way through to fully optimized outcomes on real hardware at the limits that the hardware enables with no configuration. And in the future, we're connecting this tool set for deterministic error suppression to algorithmic approaches like quantum error correction, which we've already demonstrated and we talked about at IEEE Quantum Week. We showed that we could make quantum error correction more likely to identify and the error location in an algorithm. So please, I encourage you to give it a try. You don't have to believe me in what I've talked about in terms of these quantitative benefits. Just try it and just see what the advantages are. If you go to this QR code, you can get access. If you happen to be a hardware platform vendor and you're excited about maybe making this a native part of your system, please talk to us and come find us uh, at our booth. We'd love to talk more about how we can help and what your problems are in executing algorithms on real quantum computers. We want you to get real meaningful insight. So thank you very much for your attention.
We doing any questions? Okay, we have a minute for questions. Are there any questions? Oh, okay, I guess not. Please. I think I think oh, there is one question over here in the microphone. Here comes the mic. Away. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your error mitigation framework that you're using. You said you use a dynamical decoupling to combat noise, right? But you also mentioned something about probabilistic error cancellation. Have you tried using that on your software stack? Uh, other than that, what else is uh, happening in the error mitigation part? Uh, could you clarify a bit on that? Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I want to distinguish. We, we would say we don't do error mitigation. Error mitigation tends to involve things like sampling changing structures of circuits either randomly or in a fixed way in order to systematically make changes and then kind of back out in post-processing what the best possible answer was. We are deterministically suppressing errors in the execution of circuits. That starts with dynamic decoupling, as you talked about, for canceling one kind of error, which is crosstalk and global dephasing on idling qubits, but it also involves error-robust gates operating at the T1 limit defined by AI agents. It involves better hardware-aware compilation. It involves readout error mitigation. Again, a, a probabilistic approach. All of those things together are the workflow that we choose. They can be combined with your favorite error mitigation protocol. If you like randomized compiling, if you like probabilistic error cancellation, these two things are completely complementary, just like what we do is complementary to quantum error correction. This is a way to get as close as possible to the best that the hardware will give you with none of the sampling overhead that's required in those other settings. Okay, thank Hi, you. Ben. Oh, is there one more question? Yeah, another question. Go ahead. So this hardware aware um, uh, error detection, are you mapping out bad qubit pairs and, and bad problems in, in, the, in the hardware from this hardware aware thing? And did that, would that be applying to um, testing that could be done in the manufacturing process to identify where things are going wrong? That's a great question. We do, I mean, there are two things that go on. One is we, of course, consume information that's provided to us by the back ends. The back ends will often say, here is the T1 and the T2 of each qubit and the, that day's uh, randomized benchmarking result. We consume all that information. We also run our own characterization routines that give us additional information that we have found is relevant to execution of algorithms with high performance. Now, uh, effectively, what we're doing is we're figuring out the best way to map the circuit to avoid the worst qubits and ensure that you're not applying a lot of gates on uh, particular pairs that are very noisy. You want to minimize the number of operations on those. So it's, uh, it's an, it's an AI-driven approach that consumes all of this information uh, and these additional uh, measurements that we do in order to do an optimal mapping onto the device.